Hey folks, welcome to The Mind of a Skeptical Leftist. This is the podcast where I talk to a variety of people to help spread critical thinking, progressive politics, and left-wing philosophy. I want to ha- introduce myself so that you know who you're listening to or watching. Uh, my name is Corey Johnston. I'm a laborer in rural Saskatchewan in Canada. I grew up between a family farm and a small community of about 10,000 people, and I eventually moved to a small city of about 230,000 people. Most of the people here are conservative and right-wing with many that would be considered far right. I'm different from that. I'm an anarcho-communist, an atheist, and a skeptic. This means that I try to follow ideas that are better for everyone, uh, but I also try to base those ideas on the best evidence available. As an anarchist, I believe that all people are equal and deserve to be treated as such. Uh, No one is above another, and systems that put people above each other in value are not systems that I can endorse. When you hear anarchists talk about hierarchy, this is what they mean. As a communist, I believe that everyone is entitled to a good life and all things belong to all. There is nuance to this, but above all, it entitles everyone to a safe and good life free from coercion. As an atheist, I am agnostic. It's not just that I don't believe in any god or gods, but I also believe that the claims people make about the god or gods they believe in are inconsistent and often incoherent. My anarchist tendencies mean I try not to judge others for believing things that aren't true or evidence-based, but with my mix of tendencies, I do also try to help people reach the best ideas and come to the best conclusions for everyone, rather than just supporting the status quo or being purely self-interested. I've been podcasting for almost 10 years now. I started with the atheist and skeptic communities in 2013, though I eventually moved on to more progressive communities and spaces as the toxicity and reactionary tendencies in skeptic spaces became more apparent. I do believe that a good skeptic will land on libertarian or anarchist ideals, but nobody who follows the evidence can say that capitalism is good for the world or humanity. I've only been working with video for a couple of years, and I hope that my channel can grow and build a community like some of those I've seen around other channels. However, I don't live online. I have children, a partner, a job that is demanding, and an aging parent who sometimes needs my help. This means my schedule for production is inconsistent. I hope that you will bear with me and that you enjoy my work. I have many ways that you can support this channel, and I always have other projects on the go. So look in the show notes or description box to check those out as well. My Patreon is patreon.com slash skeptical leftist, and I deeply appreciate any support you can send my way. If you have any questions or comments, feel free to contact me through any social media platform or by email at mindofaskepticalleftist at (laughs) gmail.com. All right. Hi, and welcome to The Mind of a Skeptical Leftist, a podcast where I talk to a variety of people to spread critical thinking, progressive politics, and left-wing philosophy. And today I'm joined by Dan Platt from Three Lefts. Thanks for joining me. Great to be here. So I guess a good place to start is just a little bit about yourself and your show. Uh, Sure. Uh, So I'm Dan Platt of Albany, New York. I'm plenty comfortable sharing that. Um, I have been, I'm a veteran of the new atheist movement in, in Occupy in college. And from there I transitioned to green party politics and general community projects for building dual power under various multi-tendency lenses. Um, since, you know, picking one type of leftism to do is, usually a recipe for getting dogmatic and not being skeptical. Right. You got to be skeptical <laughs> of being shoehorned or pigeonholed. So, <laughs> Fair. um, and so, so the community projects are various, you know, they involve just community gardening stuff or, um, being involved with like, you know, just spending time with my local neighborhood association, banging my head against the table surrounded by liberals or people to my right. Um, um, but also being part of a different scenes, whether it be the food bomb scene, uh, and being the Mm -hmm. underliner for the serving for a few years, um, whether it be the under one of the underliner now of the community radio station that I am a producer for. So I do a podcast, but it is also primarily a radio program that is broadcast on a local FM station. Uh, with up to 30 other people. Um, Wow. And so we will develop news capabilities eventually. Uh, But there's another local FM station in our 
area that does a news magazine that takes like 10 volunteers because they're all producing little 10, five, 10 minute segments, right? So it's a full, mm-hmm. like really full fleshed out program. We would need a similar number of people to have a particularly like news program like that. But I'm going to settle for, um, I've been making about, uh, I'm up to almost 150 episodes of my program where I simply discuss topics of my own interest, leftist strategy, and just trying to actually, I wrote this down because I'm actually transitioning now. I'm doing my last episode of the, it's a two hour program. I fill two hours on air. I do a live, um, but then edit it for online consumption later. But um, just how to figure out how to apply the various tendencies of leftist thought and and practice and putting that. So I also cover actual, you know, on the ground news too, uh, at least on national and international level. Right. Um, But now I want to transition to local news and issues because that is why I got into, you know, I was thinking about a podcast because, you know, like all of us listen to podcasts. Uh, since yep. since being in college back in '09, uh, is how they helped me radicalize, along with a lot of other things and current and mostly current events at the time. But also getting sick and un- being unfulfilled by all the various established media, whether it be NPR programming, Daily Show, or all the, all the other things, and progressives, and just noticing how ineffective they re- their strategy was, uh, at least in the long term. And how, like, even though they tout that they're the most effective by working within the mm-hmm. Dems, I saw that, like, mm, actually, no, you're, you're kind of up your own ass. And so I, I sought out alternatives. And as, as I was skeptical at the time, as a new atheist, you know, you, you got to follow the evidence wherever it leads. And to me, it led right. to radical politics and socialist slash anarchist thinking, as well as, of course, ecological thinking, which... Right. It was much more acceptable to progressives and liberals. But when it comes to like where what does it really mean to be ecological is basically to be anti-capitalist or uh, more friendly language, be post-capitalist. And, mm-hmm. and that's kind of where the Green Party is right now in our rhetoric, uh, which has shifted over the last few terms, which is why I also okay. joined the Greens because I found out there were socialists there, um, which okay. there weren't. In any other type of organization that I was a, right. that was around. Now, yeah, there's an SP and there's the IWW, but these weren't parties. Or these weren't political institutions that had been around. Right. I mean, the IDW has been around, but they they were explicitly union organizers. I wanted something yeah. that was more broader, like Occupy, that could have working groups that covered every little facet and not be in our own silo, because that was one of the things that came up with Occupy, was that everyone's in their own little silo. This is a movement that that brought a lot of people together. Yeah, for sure. I I also came out of the new new atheist slash skeptical movement. That's kind of, hence the skeptical leftist. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But but that was kind of where a weird spot when Occupy happened, because there wasn't full-blown support by the atheist community at the time for Occupy. There was a lot of back and forth. We have, we had a lot of right libertarian types within that group, that area. So did you, um, were you involved at all or were you just a spectator like myself when it came to the internal factionalism of the new atheists, when there was the proposal for the atheism plus at that, at that time I was just a spectator yeah. for atheism plus later on, I was more active within the like pro social justice type side of yes. things. That's what it was, by the way, for the audience. Um, if unless you've covered this before, um, I don't. I think was so, so. I was less spectator because I was the an officer in my local college chapter, New Atheist kind of group, um, under Center for Inquiry, and oh, I went yeah. to a you know student leadership training, which is like you know think Turning Point USA, but for New Atheists. And, <laughs> right. um, and after that, and there was Elevator Gate which very polarizing event and the proposal of from that was let's do more than just bash religion. There's obviously more work because we have our own misogyny and oppressions and systems of oppression at work just because we got rid of religion obviously doesn't mean we're free of all these other, um, this imperialism even though imperialism was not part of the conversation, but misogyny and and sexism and whatnot. And And, fi- and finding out just how what a minority we were, um, 
in the va- in the movement overall it was like it was clear this yeah. is not for us anymore this is like and we were basically expunged for more or less at least i felt i was or there was well, rather no it was, it was my own volition there's just nothing here now because right. meanwhile there was the arab spring there was the yep. events in wisconsin with the unions there uh, and the recall election which was like was which was also included in occupation of a capital for almost a month yeah. And and so there was there was mo- history was moving and it was obviously the new atheist movement was not part of that movement. It was not going right. to move with history. It was going to stay put because the forces of reaction and conservatism uh, was, was like, we, we can't we, let's not change what we're doing, even though even the liberals amongst the movement were like, we just need better science education. Once we have better science education, uh, the Republican machine of, of disenfranchising people will apparently uh be undermined <laughs> or or that or rather it's just the the analysis was that's all the problem was meanwhile yeah. you know people are being disenfranchised abortion rights being eroded and all these liberals and these libs and progressives can say is we need better science education once people are rational enough <laughs> but then they're but, but then they're all cynical about people just can't change or or John Stewart you know even now repeats the uh, um, Tina there is no alternative right? talking points human nature <laughs> people need to be retrained but they don't want to because they're just feelings over facts uh, right right and, uh, yeah so it's like well <laughs> and I'm trying to figure out what to do because they're they they didn't want to figure out what what to do because they were so yeah. positive about what to do. So I'm like, I'm investigating, I'm reading theory. And of course it's like, okay, material stuff matters more than like what affects people's feelings and emotions, where they're at in life, what are their material circumstances? Um, yeah. And that leads to socialism basically as a, as a, poli- <laughs> as a political <laughs> yeah. project, as instead yeah. of the liberal political project of, we just need to get, keep the right people in charge. Um, yeah. And the bad people. Uh, yeah, it, it was always like, uh, there's actually nothing wrong except for religion. Yes. Was the, was the, <laughs> like, racism doesn't exist. There's no such thing as structural yeah. racism, systemic racism. It's always religion. It's, uh, <laughs> there's no misogyny, patriarchy. It's just religion. And <laughs> I, and it was, of course, funny to me that they, like, obviously, well, to me, it was obvious there was way more that was wrong with the world. Um, yeah. Just watching the news, watching how the Obama administration floundered on making any positive impact. Um, right. Meanwhile, you know, the, the, the liberal Democratic refrain of like, it's just the Republicans, they need to go or they're they're stopping us from doing the good stuff. And I'm like, but I'm, I'm just listening to NPR here. And I'm fi- and just from that coverage, their coverage of things, I'm figuring out, no. Because when there was like when it came to the finance reform, you have um, the Democrat, uh, it was Barney Frank, was like spinning the wheels, and so to speak. Let's see, they weren't they the, the opposite of skeptical, very dogmatic, right? And yeah. oh yeah, oh yeah, and I want to mention that like the and I learned more in just how the pay, you know when the rubber hits the road that when it came to there was an actual movement for change that had to do with inequality and. Political corruption, which seemed to be obvious to me because as as I'm just – again, this is – I'm just following progressive media at this point for the most part because right. there wasn't any hard leftist media. That things are corrupt. Money matters in politics. It's the election. What makes the religious so powerful is the money they have. Yes. That they are tied <laughs> with big corporate money as well. It wasn't just religion. And this is clear to me. Why was I, I wasn't the only one, obviously, but I was like, so few of us had this analysis in these um, new atheist conferences or these debates where we're just, you know, circle jerking about how Dawkins owned Ken Hoven or something like that. <laughs> right. And, and, yeah. and, and there was these instances where like you had the big debate, the debate that's supposed to solve the problem, right? Once... Bill Nye. Right. Bill Nye versus Ken Ham. <laughs> that Ken Ham. That you, you, you read my mind. We're on the same wavelength. This was supposed to fix – this was supposed to have an effect, right, yeah. or, uh, on, on the followers of cre- creationism. It had no effect whatsoever. And, yeah. and, and in that fallout, it's like, well, this is, this is basically a, 
not ha- not helping really. It's just making us yeah. feel better um, when we feel like we're our sites winning. But really, meanwhile, if you care about progressive politics, the Republicans are always winning, or capitalism is winning, really. Yeah, um, yeah. and that's what I figured out. Parties not so far apart; they are on the same team. They had all the opportunities to do what they say they're going to do for the Obama years, and they didn't. So it's like, well, they're just liars then. I'm not going to take anything they say seriously when it comes to you got to vote for us or else or this or that. Um, But the rubber hit the road where I'm joining Occupy. Uh, Particularly, I I went on day one because for some fucking great, crazy reason, Adbusters was in my college bookshop. So, like, I was getting supplies or something, and App Busters was, like, in the line to the cashier. And and this is this is one of those radicalizing moments, right? We all have them, right? And it was the issue where, like, the title of it is Capitalism is the Crisis. I had right. never seen that rhetoric before <laughs> in my life. And and it just had <laughs> this... Holy shit. And it had this weird, you know, uh, painting of, like, a woman, like, a girl, like, eating a, a saucer of ice cream looking wistfully, you know? And... I'm like, holy shit, that makes a lot of fucking sense. And so yeah. I, I pick up Bad Busters and I'm picking it up every quarter, as it were, and for and for that year. And they came up with the idea of Occupy Wall Street. One of their, I, they throw out a lot of ideas. That was one of their winners. Um, so right. I went day one and, and then I came back a few days later and then I kept coming basically. Uh, I spent every Friday there because that was my open day, no classes then. And, uh, and try to go like twice a week, I guess. And, uh, and I worked the info table because when I was a new atheist, I was tabling in my college. Uh, and that's what I like doing. Um, mm. So I, I tabled for Occupy instead. And, and, and I encouraged my fellow new atheist Center for Inquiry, which is a nonprofit educational foundation, to endorse Occupy or to show up. And from my colleagues who had, you know, they were coordinators or whatever their position was. We can't get involved. It's political. We would risk our nonprofit status or pretty much that. That was the answer I got. It wasn't even an yeah. ideological difference or disagreement, but and but it was under it was there. It was unspoken. Yeah. Yeah. And then, I mean, in the time since then, like uh, Sam Harris has endorsed race realism, uh, <laughs> New atheist, like hasn't he retracted James that Lindsay? lately though? Oh, did he? Wasn't that uh, a few? That- <laughs> it was a few years ago that he would talk to the race realists, but maybe since um, George Floyd and whatever the second round of BLM that he has ca- changed his mind a bit. He's certainly not having the dark enlightenment folks on his show anymore. Well, that's mostly because they're anti-vax now so he can't right yeah yeah there had to be something he disagreed with so it wasn't the race realism but maybe i suppose the anti-vaxxers maybe made him think twice about like these people are crazy and they're not following the evidence in any capacity (laughs) and it probably cast some shade on but but i haven't haven't listened to his show i um i have a book signed by him you know in my new atheist days with the moral landscape right and i kind of you know I still have two copies of At the End of Faith, like sitting on the bookshelf. So I was I was a fan at one time, but yeah, but you know it's it's good to outgrow your heroes uh, and find uh, new ones um, or whatever. <laughs> Kill yeah. your heroes as they were. Yeah, that's right. Uh, but uh, yeah, so that was my that was you know the beginning of my journey. Then Occupy, then Green Party. I mentioned I ran for mayor in my city as a Green Party candidate. It was a quinsotic campaign. Okay. It was an outreach campaign. Of course, I'm not going to win. But I wanted to grow the party, and that meant canvassing. And Mm -hmm. uh, I did not was not successful in growing the party. But I did talk to a lot of people, so I learned. I made some lessons, though. That's 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 usually what leftists who fail say. Like I learned some lessons. Um, the major issue was that there was this guy who ran who primaried me. Like we had a Green Party primary. His thinking was that it would get us more attention to have a primary. I told him he was oh. he was being an idiot. Um, people will pay attention <laughs> if we have a <laughs> if we have a unified campaign where I have multiple people helping me. Um, I'm the senior here. Um, he was he was fresh out of college and kind of more identified as an ML kind of leftist, but okay, but not really. Um, he wasn't really good at arguing it. He he just 
had an ex- economics degree, so you kind of felt smart. But uh, when it came to debating <laughs> and being and being on the forum stage, he, he looked like an asshole. But uh, the thing is, he didn't expect to beat me in the primary. And uh, he was so he just thought having the primary would be, you know, get us attention. Of course, it didn't. Itself a good move. No <laughs> one covered our primary. People covered me as a candidate because I knew what I was doing and put out a, you know, made a pre- had a press release. He right. didn't. He didn't know what he was doing at all. But he beat me by three votes because we only have a 30 person primary <laughs> pretty much. Um, <laughs> and, and he spent the summer talking to the Greens. He must have. I don't know how many times he knocked on Green Party doors. Uh, There's basically 200 in Albany. But I was canvassing whole neighborhoods. I canvassed 100 different blocks. And, yeah, I hit Greens Up when I was petitioning. I needed 30 signatures. But I I didn't really follow up because, to me, me it was about finding new Greens, particularly finding Greens that were actually leftists or pseudo-leftists or baby leftists uh, or potential or baby leftists who were then potential members. Because most registered Greens are, in fact, some left liberal type of old anti-war person. Yeah, they're anti-war, but they're not really anti-imperialist or anti-capitalist. Mm-hmm. Um, and that's that's mostly registered Greens. So members are a different story. But registered Greens are people who are all over the place. Uh, sometimes, right. and, and yeah. a portion of them are anti-vax because uh, they're just so anti-nonconformist or whatever. Or, or they're... yeah. Yeah. You know, they're not anti big farm. They're not big government. Like they're that. not big government. Yeah. You know, they're 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 left libertarian to a, to a certain degree. But again, they're older, so they still have reactionary views. But anyway, what I learned was that um, local media, even with I got the best coverage I probably could have gotten, and it didn't matter. Um, one in thirty people when I canvassed knew I was running or read my knew of my campaign through the paper, um, which is a local Hearst paper. We still have a local paper. But it's Hearst owned, and everyone doesn't really like them because um, uh, they're only ha- they're always just covering half the story. You know, they leave out m- many details and, and whatever, and tow yeah, it can be frustrating. And tow a certain line. <laughs> but they are the most you know, place to actually be informed somewhat. You know, you, you need to add your own analysis, and that's something I hope to do with my show going forward. Is what I found was, and and from lessons from previous movement leaders like Black Panthers at uh, conferences I've gone to over the years who mentioned that their organizing depended on them having their own newspaper, their own lines of communication. You know, um, right. the the metaphor of the RPG party. You need a tank to go out and fight. You need the cleric to do the healing and to make do food prep. You need the bard to sing the praises right. of the cause um, and, and reinforce the work that the activists are doing, because if 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 the thousands do not know that the work is being done by even just a few, it makes their work seem well. It is less impactful. Um, right. The people don't yeah, know about sense. it. They they fell. They fall. They could beat a corporate you know corporate thing. They could block weak block pipelines, and people don't know of our right. victories. Yeah. Um, unless you're reading um, It's Going Down or a similar project. Um, right. So. Yeah, because you, tr- you can't rely on like mainstream media to cover stuff like that. They'll just ignore yeah. it. Like, Or even um, Twitch politics slash BreadTube, um, which aren't <laughs> news gathering enterprises. They're entertainment enterprises. Yeah. And yeah. uh, which is why it's like it's not going to form into a network. It should, if it, if 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 any left tuber was serious, it should be. We should be forming a network, um, like the Young Turks. But that was still kind of a central core of people doing their project and then recruiting people, and uh, or the Real News Network, which is almost like a TV yeah, station. Real News is out of yeah. out of they have a, a Baltimore, so they have a place and. But they, but they were able to network with, with, so they had their own stable of talking heads that they were able to cover international stories better than the cable networks, or at least just yeah. as well, but with analysis that was actually insightful and so on. <laughs> right, yeah. So I like to develop that for the, my local scene um, 
And I use the word scene yeah, because cool. it's like play acting. I want it, it needs to be more than a scene, you know. It needs to be more right. than play. Um, obviously, but have fun. Right. Uh, I was reading something actually. I think it was just earlier today talking about how a lot of uh, like organizations that are activist oriented they uh, fail if they miss out on the social and human interaction part of things. So you got to have the, uh, the fun too. Like you got to have people getting along and mm-hmm. having relationships and such uh, so that we care about each other. You burn other, out. You know, yeah. It's how people yeah. burn out. And even when, but it's almost like some of the burnouts caused by saying, Oh, but, and on top of all the other important work you're doing, you also have to organize a party. <laughs> which which <laughs> yeah, is for true. some for introvert yeah. nerds like myself is actually asking quite a lot uh i've tried right, doing yeah. so and i'm i'm always terrible with it um i always wanted someone else to handle that you know we all have a role and things we're good at but we have to work as a team at the same time but there's also yeah, the phrase sure. uh you know if you want something done right or rather Assume you're going to do things yourself, and then if others help you, then that's a blessing slash, you know, that's the victory. Um, but yeah. sometimes I've done things, assumed I'm doing them by myself, and because of that, I'm not asking enough people to help me or what mm-hmm. have you. And so one of those lessons of um, organizing versus activism, which is one of those distinctions that's important, is the ask, the ask, 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 the ask for help. You know, I'm, I'm, I've, I'm, I have some volunteers I'm working with and they are afraid to ask people or they're discouraged mm-hmm. or they have asked people, they don't get a positive response and they don't ask again. You know, they're like, oh, it's not <laughs> worth it. Or it's like, what's the point? You know, they go cynical. It's too much work. They go, uh, cy- they go <laughs> cynical, you know, and, and I have that, you know, when it comes to phone banking and canvassing, you know, you, you have to. What is discouraging is the proportionality, and this goes for social media too, that, you know, you need to reach 100 people to have 10 good interactions. And then out of those 10, you'll have one joiner or supporter, someone who actually shows up. Um, This goes for when you just have want to mobilize people. You know, you can have um, uh, an event like – I'll give you a fun example. Um, Rush Area 51. You know, you had millions of people saying, like, they were going to do that (laughs) as a joke. And then maybe a thousand people, it was that, well, a thousand people came to Arizona or Nevada, rather. Um, But then maybe a hundred actually went to Area 51. Um, Right. Yeah. But that wasn't an organization. You know, that was just a, we'll have a party here, show up. An organ, that's activism or mobilization. Organizing is having committees in place to bus people to a place, to to have a material goods on hand, to have health care if things go wrong, you know. If someone right. was shot, it would be the military that would have to pay, take them to the hospital um, <laughs> or something like that. But, uh, but, you know, black blockers, no, you have your medics on hand. You have your people who uh, have the equipment, who bring the equipment. You have your, your ride and, and so on. Uh, I've done one. But, um, That's probably like like why it was so exceptional the uh, ro- the protests after George, George Floyd because like it's a lot to get that many people to motivate you know motivated to do a thing like that it's just it's a lot in that case and it was anger plus, you know but it wasn't organizing right, yeah. which is why yeah uh, it dissipates these movements these yeah. these these energies they dissipate because they weren't. Getting organized, there was no or there was a ver- various reasons, not a desire to organize. Um, right. My role in the last few years and continuing forward will be to convince people of the necessity to organize, to be in an organization. So why I'm a green because I feel even with our, you know, it seems like we're failing all the time, though 1,200 greens have been elected over the, our history to local offices. Um, I still feel way more empowered because right. as things shift and change, at least I'm in a thing that has been around for 40 years, 30 years or more now, uh, about yeah. 30 years. And meanwhile, you have these other orgs that start and then they're gone in four years. Like they're, they're literally like there are many things that only existed for as long as Trump was president. And yeah. you, you kind of saw it 
and I'll point out to everyone on the left, the, the online left or the marginal left, that you know there's there's a consensus that we just have to get Trump out of office, and the you know vote for Biden, any you know get Trump out. This campaign succeeded, yeah. but what else? And what next? Like, <laughs> yeah. There was no organization, no organizing to do something later. And because yeah. of that, everyone had nothing to do unless they were in an org or the intention to join or start an org, to start tenant organizing or what have you. But the energy, the thousands of people that came out um, during the pandemic, almost because people didn't have to go go to work, um, now they, they were free to come show up to a, a, pro, a march. But marching is not enough. Marching is a morale booster. It is not right. action. It is not political action, um, yeah. and it, it actually, um, which is why uh, there's actually no p- policy effect whatsoever. Right. Um, yeah. Even in all, my city of Albany, as a result of the reaction to the protests in 2020, the riot, which was only an evening, for the first time, tear gas was actually used in Albany by our police. And um, our common council could not, um, there was an intention to ban it because one of our common council people got gassed and almost died. Wow. And it was used particularly uh, in residential neighborhoods twice where it's going to people's homes who aren't part of the march, who aren't even demonstrating. And the city council did not ban it because uh, half of them like cops and, and the cops were yeah. saying, well, we still need to be able to have this tool because what happens if there's another riot? We'll be powerless if uh, if we don't tear gas. Um, and yeah, so that was um, another another failure, I suppose. Um, and, and after that, the DSA simply disappeared. I don't know what they're doing now. Um, <laughs> yeah. And, yeah, uh, and they, they avoid my gaze. Well, um, a friend of mine uh, avoids, avoids my gaze, actually. Um, oh, is that right? He was one of the DSA uh, leaders. Um, oh, geez. It, it hurts my feelings, obviously, because it's like, you know, we were, we're comrades when it comes to food, not bombs. But then when now he's a DSA chapter leader, it's suddenly he can't talk to me like a comrade because we have different strategies for elections. Even right. though they've made it clear that as a local org, they want to do tenant organizing and not elections. So it's like, what does it matter? But when it came to endorsing Howie Hawkins for president 2020, only a handful of leftist orgs or, group or associations would endorse him and what have you. And okay. that was very demoralizing. Hmm. Yeah, that's. <sighs> I've known, like, I know a few people in the U.S. and in Canada who have, uh, they've joined more radical groups because the DSA or the DSC uh, kind of lost momentum, I guess, mm. uh, in a lot of ways. Like after, the end of Sanders' campaign, I would assume. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah that's right. They were so yeah. deflated yeah. after that. They were so deflated. Yeah. Like, what were they going to do? They had nothing else to do now. Um, <laughs> that's what's, uh, that was uh, like this, they're walking to a wall. And I, I, we were, us Greens were telling them that. Just like 2016, you're just walking to that wall again. Um, anyway. Yeah. By <laughs> sticking with the Democratic Party. It's... Yeah. But um, I don't want to, you know, electoralism is part of the grander strategy of dual power building. Uh, the right. Green Party work, or whether it's Socialist Party or Socialist Alternative, uh, these organizations are part of a coalition of other kind of dual power kind of building stuff and because once you build that economic base of co-ops or whatever you're gonna st- need to take local power and a party is the tool for doing that and it's also what pushed mm-hmm. even in american history it's what pushed the dems or the parties the duopoly to act in anything any reform passed in american history it happened in conjunction with some independent movement that was starting to win offices, um, yeah. whether it was the Populist Party at one point, Socialists in the New Deal era, or the, rather the Depression. And uh, people don't think of it this way, but the Republican Party itself was a third party that split from the Whigs on a particular mm-hmm. issue and 
in a three-way race, won the presidency. Because when it comes to a three-way race, you don't need 50%. Yeah. You don't need a full yeah. majority <laughs> to win when it's a three-way race. You only need 33%. And when some green congressional races we've had and other types of races, we've gotten up to 25%. You know, we're, we're getting close sometimes um, in particular races with particular candidates. Right. Um, but I want to point out, like, rate choice ballots aren't enough. You know, you need a whole gamut of reforms if um, independent politics is to have any foothold. And and if it means, like, and if people have the mindset of, okay, we have to do everything but electoralism, I'm cool with that, you know, as I do community projects as well. Um, just know, like, but what's the long-term strategy? Because anything you do, radical community project can be co-opted by the system if you don't have uh, the means of resisting it. You know, yeah. your the local Dems in your city will co-opt you. It is the mar- is Marx is just straight Marxism that that's what will happen. Political yeah. economy will 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 have the, that will pressure you into giving up that autonomy you earned or that housing co-op you built. Um, because you didn't actually, you weren't actually doing system change when when building the, these alternatives. It needs right. to be more general. It needs to be big. You need to think bigger than that. Um, yeah. Now, conversely, Cooperative Jackson in Jackson, Mississippi, is doing that and like building alternative economy, and they won local offices as well, even the mayorship. But then they okay. were slammed yeah. down by the state and county levels. And their political program was was stymied and sabotaged. So their kind of lesson was kind of, well, one lesson from the anarchist perspective is don't bother with any electoralism. (laughs) But it's like, but but how do you do revolution if you don't take power? And yeah, because power isn't just like your local neighborhood. It's the military. It's bureaucracies, you know, to have a modern state, you know, if you're get, if you're going to devolve the big state into smaller states or micro states, you got to have a plan for doing that. You got to, I mean, just, yeah. you know, and um, you got to think it, it's a, it's a really hard problem. Like, <laughs> like a problem, because, I, yeah, a problem because every to time figure out. Yeah. Yeah. Like every time you get somebody into power or in a position where they're getting close to it, like, it seems like the state will, or like, or the big parties like here it's the liberals and the conservatives Mm -hmm. they will you know do whatever they can to eliminate the third parties or the fourth parties from gaining ground and then you have like people within those parties like uh who then are part of the structure that exists that stops them from taking any actual action and like but like you say like anything outside of the electoral stuff you can't actually develop enough power without the use of the state in some ways. Mm-hmm. It's a, it's a very hard problem. Like I, I don't, I don't pretend to have any answers. <laughs> certain strands of anarchism want to like, want to work around the state, but you can't really ignore that elephant in the room. Um, Cause right, you, can, exists, you can start, you have to deal with it in some way. Just right? look at what happened to Chaz. Look at what happened to Occupy. Yeah. We set up these autonomous zones and you, we didn't actually have any control. The police and the city had the control. Um, yeah. And if there were more people in city government to say, let's hold off, let's let people have autonomous zones, develop them, codify them even, um, we, you need allies that would help you do that. And SOC Dems aren't really good enough or SOC Dems who are Democrats are not good enough because they'll have to side with the power structure. Um, just as the I remember squad uh, does. during Occupy, there was a, uh, I guess, a support encampment in Regina, the city I'm in, uh, Regina, Saskatchewan, Canada. Okay, gotcha. Is where I am. <laughs> and so there was a support encampment, and I don't remember how long it took, but it wasn't very long before the city council said, "No, we just got to get them out." Mm-hmm. Like, <laughs> like just this send is them illegal. To and get them out. Yeah, this is illegal. You can't sleep in the park. <laughs> so so it was like, but we do still have regular uh, indigenous groups uh, camping out in uh, our park 
or Wascana Park right near our legislative building mm-hmm. uh, for, in various protests. Like there was one about suicide uh, prevention. Uh, I think it was last year or the year but before. But they're usually temporary, right? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. They are always, they're always temporary and they always face that crackdown by uh, the police at some it's point. It's always over their head. I loved yeah. Occupy because it was a protest that was continuous. One of the things I hated about protests and why I didn't really do any protesting before Occupy uh, or I didn't believe in it was, well, I, I attended the big protest in 04 uh, during the RNC in New York and it had no effect whatsoever on the war. Uh, yeah. It was, it was, it was, I was told the biggest protest ever in American history didn't matter whatsoever. So it's like, well, yeah. what, 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 what use is this? And any other protests I saw, um, maybe it's kind of the, sort of the John Stewart line. It looks ridiculous. Um, and it, uh, it's only, it's just, it's even when it, it has like, you know, it's covered by the media, it's just a 30 minute segment and then it's gone. It's like it didn't even yeah. happen. Yeah. Uh, a continuous protest, however, was something that couldn't be ignored and it was continuous. It could evolve. It could actually exist and be an institution. Um, but it had to be a formal organization. Now there was a formal organization of Occupy in New York, the general assembly, which is an anarchist org. Um, and, uh, but, uh, but they didn't have a means of recruiting people or they didn't seem to have a plan to. And mm. at the end of the day, they're, they were facilitation and they didn't, they were like, our job isn't actually to facilitate the meetings, which is why the GA would devolve into meetings that did not work and would obviously turn people off of meetings. And the thing about meetings, they're totally necessary. They just have to be run well. People just have bad experiences yeah. because most people do not know how to actually run a meeting. It's sort of like people who think they know how to, they're, they're, they're computer literate. And then you ask them to do something like uh, share a Google Doc and then they're incompetent um, or, they, or they need to, they're handheld. And so I spent a good amount of my time post Occupy in the months after um, the, the, the crackdown. Learning how to be a facilitator because my big problem with Occupy was the meetings. So, and the fact that the GAs were too big, they should have been broken up or, you know, you, what you do is you make breakout groups, you know, um, and, and there are general rules that were just the wrong rules to have. Um, one could argue it was internal sabotage. You know, you had some provocateur who said, oh no, we need 80% consensus. Uh, yes, Mm. you know, make it a yes or no vote. But the point of consensus is that you don't vote. There is no vote mean. You know, you, you hear everybody out and then you formulate a decision that everyone likes or can consent to. Um, but that's not what was done because you can't do it with 100 people. Um, with an assembly, it's not meant to be a general discussion. It's just meant to be the, the formal process or something. You're, you're meant to do, uh, make the decisions in groups of 10 and then you come together in an assembly And then you all consent to what everybody came up with Um, as it goes back and forth between a larger group and the groups of 10. But this wasn't done, um, mostly because of the logistics of it. But there was a movement towards that at Occupy Wall Street to like if you're going to get fed by the kitchen um, and get benefit from all the donations coming in, you got to join a working group. You have to be in. You have to be organized, basically. You have to join the organization in some way. It's very loose. It's not like there's any wall to joining, only that you need to give another hour of your time to a working group and be active. And and this um, was a vast improvement, a bit of improvement, but it was also very late in that it was two weeks later that the NYPD moved in or rather Mm -hmm. made their move. Um, right. cause there was a two week span between where they throw the city threatened to evict us and everyone showed up and like standard military tactics, you wait until there's a false sense of security, like, oh, okay, the police blacked off. We're secure. We can go continue the rest of the winter, you know, go into the winter. And then two weeks later, then they move in like middle of the night when there's the least people there, um, and throw everything out. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. But it was also the coordinated, you know, from the national level crackdown of all encampments. Um, Al- right. Albany's went a little longer because there was a bit more consent from the si- support from the city council. Um, but that, at the end of the day, also uh, had to get swept out for health and safety reasons. 
Of course. <laughs> but all, all the city would have to do is provide porta potties, and uh, the problem would be solved. Um, mm-hmm. Which they'll only do for money making festivals or parties, and right. not for anything that has actual purpose besides making people money. Um, because otherwise the city has no public bathrooms, um, or, or at least, um, only a few, a handful. Um, any public bathrooms get like, it, it's a little apocalyptic in that if a public bathroom is open long enough, the, like the pipes would get, uh, scalped out of it. Right. Um, or it would be used for shooting up because we don't have safe ejection sites. You know, these are things right. that, like, you can solve if there was more social infrastructure and progressive thinking. But it turns out, actually, even though we're a Democrat, one-party state, um, one-party government, uh, it's actually quite conservative or allows it to be conservative because even yeah. Republicans will be registered Democrat so their vote can count. Uh, or they can have a say <laughs> in yeah in the uh, in city government. Um, let's uh, let's kind of shift gears a little bit. I'm I'm curious more about uh about your show too. Um, you said it's uh, currently it's a two a two hour show uh, on community radio. I'll be shifting to one hour soon. Basically, I'm going to do one more two hour show uh, this week. Once I release that, I'll be shifting to one hour. And doing local news and issues. Mostly reading from the local Hearst paper, but also whatever blogs I come across. Facebook posts, because that's where citizen journalism happens pretty much. uh, Where people just report things and it's just, it leads to conversations. And also people uh, kvetching about things in the city and what's not being fixed, or what has been fixed, um, and what have you. That's Sorry. awesome. Uh, yeah. No worries. You have to keep reminding uh, me. So what is, uh, what is three lefts? Uh, it comes from, so when I was, um, when I had a job, it, um, and I'm still, I'm currently a state worker. Um, I was um, in test distribution. I was, my job was packing all of the state tests that go to all the schools. And so it was a lot of time to listen to podcasts. So one I listened to was this particular national anarchist, really weird tendency. But he had an episode that really tickled me uh, titled The Left of the Left of the Left. Because there was a book by the title Left of the Left. And he, and he just added another left to it. And it made me th- chuckle because it's like, oh, three lefts make a right. Um, and so on. And, but it also stands for the three types of leftism. Socialism anarchism and ecology so my logo is three flags uh or the three colors of black red and green which usually people associate with the you know black nationalism or that type of movement garveyism even but uh but for me it um i just use them in different you know different combinations um to represent the three less because like a good sandwich or meal or whatever you need all three um, because if you're just a socialist, then, you know, you're probably going to be too hierarchical um, and not think ecologically and you turn off environmentalists. If you're just environmentalist, you're going to succumb to green capitalism. If you're just an anarchist, you'll be um, disorganized and not be effective outside of a local commune collective context. Um, there is such a thing as an anarchist network nationally, uh, but they don't do shit. Um, the red, the, the, the black rose federation comes to mind. Uh, but they, and I was thinking about, you know, I was shopping around for the next org to join after occupy and I was closing shop with that. Um, but they were, they were too exclusive. They, they were just too dot. They were just way more dogmatic than they had any right to be. Um, yeah. cause if you had any kind of like, you know, positive attitude for government policy or, Green New Deal, because in 2010 to 2012, Green New Deal actually, for, for us Greens, meant something. Right. Um, now we call it the eco-socialist Green New Deal, to clarify. Uh, because when we say Green New Deal, we do mean nationalizing the um, industries that have, um, we, what, what's it called when, um, uh, ela- inelastic demand, that's it. Mm-hmm. The, the industries of inelastic demand um, nationalizing those and subsidizing art and all the good stuff and, uh, and not just declaring victory when there's money for charging stations 
uh, or <laughs> electric cars that are made in sweatshops overseas um, right. and whatnot. So, right. So you need all three um, because just having just being one tendency is because and then you, you can see it across the spectrum that people are one type and they're insufferable. <laughs> In what in some way, <laughs> or, or or they fall yeah. on their face when it comes to strategizing because they are missing a very serious piece of the puzzle. You know, anarchists yeah, miss out on Marxist Leninist revolution, you know, revolution building. Um, socialists, pure socialists, or you know, Mar- MLs miss out on hor- the horizontalism and American culture and and what on people's uh, apprehensions to being organized in the first place yeah. um, and people who are just ecologists completely leave, have no analysis of, of capitalism empire and, and kind of, they think that, well, I mean, they, they almost know that just doing their little projects isn't enough, but then they, right. they, they've accepted the ruling class narrative that revolution's bad and communism failed and, and leftist and even union movements just, are just a dead end. So what else can we do? There is nothing else to do. We just have to start our co-op and 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 for our middle class, you know, keep our middle class lifestyle going. Um what in recycle. Yeah. Um well, let's uh we're almost at an hour already, but let's quickly go through uh counter propaganda. Mhm. So you've got uh uh, for, under counter propaganda, you have third party politics for local and state, and electoral politics and revolutionary successes. Yeah, I, I was just being really broad there, but what I can do is kind of give people some ammo when it comes to. I want to do some counter propaganda about Green Party politics. So okay. I have, I, I need, I could make a scientific treatise on it, but there's a scale of like one to five. When it comes to people's reaction to when I say I'm a green, to how mad are they about Ralph Nader in 2000? Um, <laughs> so I'll point out some counterfacts, counter propaganda, that in Florida, Bush got more votes from Democrats than than Ralph Nader did. Um, right. That when it comes to exit polling across the board, regardless of the scale of the election, whether it's national or state or local election, that when it comes to exit polling, people who vote green or other third party, maybe libertarian too, uh, let's we'll leave them out, um, will say that they would have stayed home if there wasn't the third party choice. This goes up, this fluctuates, but it's always more than 50%. So yeah. when looking at numbers, when people just say, if these million people who voted for Jill Stein voted for Clinton, she would have beaten Trump. Like it, because they're looking at state but by state. There's no way state that by those state. people would have all voted for. <laughs> yeah, yeah, they're they're just assuming that were robots that were turned on and off because their ground game was just so fucking great, right? At mobilizing yeah. voters, but that's the point. They didn't. <laughs> you need ground game, but I won't go into that. Uh, but I will point out is that for the last few months, I've been doing live streams with a, a, a streamer uh, called BreadTube. Not bread to bread theory, and okay, so yeah. every other Sunday I've been going doing a stream where I cover pamphlets from the fifties on how to organize. So I've been going through all these step by step processes of what it nice. really means to politically organize. So I won't get into any of that. But let's see what are the talking points uh, when it came to Florida. I mean, first remind people that the Supreme Court stopped the count, and if the court count continued, then Gore would have won. Yeah. So it wasn't even a matter of. The votes were taken from Gore, and that's what cost him the election. No, the, remember the election was stolen. But when, but when it comes down to the fives who are really upset about the Green Party or other progressives, even that say we're spoilers, they are protecting the establishment and the institutions that they somehow still have faith in, whether it be the Supreme Court or rather, not that they have faith in it, but they just know that they can't do anything about them. That they have accepted their immutability. That capitalism isn't going away. The Supreme Court is not going away. The American government isn't going away. Right. This is defeatism. Um, because the ties, history, actual study of history will show that things are never actually permanent. Not even for 30, 40 years. <laughs> American institutions have been durable and flexible. But they are flexing 
in response to independent populist and leftist movements. Yeah. Um, sometimes right wing movements as well. Like that's how prohibition happened, you know, but, right. uh, but that's something to learn that like, you know, when an independent independent being the operable term third party started winning and got, you know, 20%, 15% presidential vote. That's when big reforms were happening. It wasn't a, there, there's always a, uh, what was it called? A, um, order of operations kind of fallacy of what caused what causation fallacy, I guess. Mm -hmm. yeah, and yeah. you really got to study history hard to know, cause it is a puzzle and it is always on, you kind of always are going to be unsure of what really caused what, but the point is it's complicated, but a th independent third party was in the mix. And if you take it out to me, you're left with the kinds of politics that we've been having since the sixties where there was not an independent third party in the 60s. There was nowhere to go once McGovern lost in that primary in 72. Um, or he was the presidential candidate and lost to Nixon in 68. That's what it was. Um, but then when he tried again in 72, um, the progressive leftist you know, movements, that failed. And they just didn't know what to do next. So then all the hippies basically became yuppies. Not yup, yeah, yeah, yuppies. Yeah. Uh, soon after. <laughs> um, so let's see what else. So yeah, no, there's no such thing as a spoiler effect. That's my kind of propaganda. That any um, arguments that third party votes or spoiler votes that they ruin or that we're like we help the Republicans even is is all based on faulty statistics, outright lies. And yeah. and uh, and mis or willful or unwillful misinterpretation of events, and and so on. And sometimes it's outright. We slender. have uh, we have something similar here in Canada where uh, like we have the NDP, which is the New Democratic Party. Uh, they're like our biggest third party, mm -hmm. and uh, even though they actually have a lot of, they get seats and they get you know they represent certain areas there's still like this idea in the popular political sphere that a vote for the NDP is a vote for the team that I'm the opposite of. <laughs> so if I'm a conservative, yes. I'm saying, if you vote for the NDP, you're voting for the liberals. And if I'm a liberal, then I'm saying, yeah. if you vote for the NDP, you're then you're the voting for the conservatives. Yeah. <laughs> the way they say when people so vote green. <laughs> well, yeah, that's right. They say the, the same thing likely, right? Too. <laughs> Yeah. Interesting. Yeah, it's a uh, but to your but to own Canadian history, your national health care system or single payer system was a result of the initial success of the NDP. Yeah, I've read. that's right. Um, and uh, now in the Green Party, <laughs> both in Canada and in the U.S., uh, though, because the Greens, since you have somewhat more of a parliamentary system, the Greens have actually gotten some seats, you know, with Theresa May. Um, but you have had a consistent party that uh, Greens who are just um, Dems light or environmental liberals where, you know, the yeah. slogan of not left, not right, but forward. Uh, this is most <laughs> yeah. this is most green parties in the world. But and that's something that I like to point out, like there are green parties all over the world. We're the world movement. We're the, we're the actual only global movement. You can actually look right. to because there's no other organization that actually has chat. Well, unless it's, you're talking about Doctors Without Borders, but I mean political one. Right. Um, there's no other. There's no fifth international. OK, um, <laughs> we'd like yeah. to have one, I guess. But there's no socialist or communist party in, in various countries that could uh, make a coalition. Not even. Dis yeah. Like, that, not even not, that could. They're not. They exist, I guess. They're, but yeah, they're not remotely <laughs> similar. At least most green parties are somewhat similar. Um, the yeah. U.S. one, though, we've evolved a bit, um, mostly because of our particular situation of being completely marginal in our non-parliamentary system, as the U.S. is actually the most draconian. Right. And here's my another um, line of counter-propaganda. Republicans are, like, in charge of voter disenfranchisement. You know, that's what people focus on. It's the right to. But Democrats do party disenfranchisement. And that's the other side that's just as vitally important because even if every all every voter was fully enfranchised, if there's only the two choices, Coke and Pepsi, you have no choice. Yeah, um, that's right. 
And Democrats in every state that they have control over, yeah, maybe they pass a bit more of voter enfranchisement. Early voting reform was the latest success. But at the same time, they raise this, the voting, the thresholds to be a third party, to have ballot access and what have you. Um, <laughs> here in New York, and in, we're not the only state now that has the highest vote, you know, uh, petition threshold in the world um and there was it was tripled by como uh during the pandemic because he put it in a bill that couldn't there was the budget and no one could vote against it and it tripled the threshold that we needed to retain our ballot access which we did get enough votes for by the way in 2020 but if it if the rules weren't changed um we couldn't meet the triple threshold now also for petitioning to get access again we need triple the amount of signatures which is 45,000 um but uh you need 50% more than that because a number of your signatures will be thrown out um and that's and who who does the throwing out both major parties particularly the Dems right. um cuz they don't want a left wing they don't want actually want a left flank and this is something progressives and sock Dems don't seem to freaking understand is they don't actually want a left flank they don't want this they say well maybe in one side of the mouth they'll say yes we want a full big 10 party right. and then the other like you fucking assholes you know they're getting in the way and we're, we're honest about being in the way um and being in opposition and uh, that's how we've had a part to play in banning fracking in new york one of the few states to do so right uh, so let's see. So that's my counter propaganda of that. So yeah. So that, there we go. That's awesome. Uh, so quickly, I guess, uh, foes and comrades. We've got uh, new agers for foes. <laughs> yeah, I, I have a particular pet peeve for new agers. Um, they and, my, and I'm talking from personal experience. People that they you know they seem they it's like they pretend to have left wing views or left liberal views, but reactionary hippies, but they're reactionary <laughs> hippies at the end of the day. Um, this is to counter, you know, like to, there is a type of hippie, which is actually called the yippie. And uh, do you know the difference between a hippie and a yippie is? I do not. A yippie is a hippie <laughs> who has been beaten up by a cop. Okay. <laughs> and, um, cause they went to an anti-war demonstration and they got, right. Cause they, they actually, got, they actually got beaten did up did something cause they were actually yeah. doing something dangerous or, or threatening um and they're the ones that popularized pieing politicians or, or people in power oh yeah, yeah. Pies. um uh da, 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 da. oh that's awesome so right yeah so so they're just they seem to be politically useless they will not join an organization they will not pay dues to anything they will always make excuses for why they can't like help um they uh, i mean it's also the fake fake deepness um, of like right. almost like Joe Rogan almost counts as a, a new ager because it's <laughs> it's just conspiracy yeah. minded theory. Their 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 ideology is conspiracy and and I think if you go through this whole like the 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 conspiracy theory iceberg that it's just completely anti materialist. It's even anti idealist almost. Um, just right. connecting dots. And smoking a lot of pot and kind of messing up your brain. <laughs> because I see – it's not a trend or anything, but, I mean, there are these characters who they in, – in an effort to better understand the world and have connection with nature and, and the world or reality, they fuck up their brain with hallucinogenics. And they think it's healthy because it's not a man-made drug right. or made by the CIA. But they're still fucked up. And it frustrates me because it's like, what do you say to them? There's no, it's like they're not addicted, but at the same time, they kind of are addicted to being hallucinating. The idea and, of being hallucinating. And the yeah. fact that and, – and the attitude, if I may be you know, a little gripey here, the attitude that because I had a hallucinogenic experience, I now understand things in a way that you can't <laughs> with yeah. your book as learning. a person who with your book learning a a lot and of... science <laughs> and rat and, and skeptical thinking <laughs> yeah, no. um they're the true skeptics because they're skeptical of like <laughs> but again reality yeah, yeah. Man. But it come, yeah right even reality <laughs> itself 
and and I and, yeah. I and I and I and I have a former roommate now who actually probably actually has brain damage because he was he just did too much ayahuasca over time, like not just once, but he he was been doing it for years right. in an effort to yeah. solve his emotional trauma or his issues. It is a very popular position right now to think that uh, mushrooms or psilocybin or however you fucking say it yes. is like. Uh, a cure-all for various things, as well as can improve your insight into the world. And it's... Yeah. I did a lot of mushrooms when I was younger, and I was very... I, like, I actually had to read. I had to, actually had to learn to learn. Like, I couldn't learn from being on drugs. <laughs> Which is why I'm frustrated, because it's like there's this... Like, it's some kind of... Well, to, to them, it is an, it is a alternative to an actual education um, yeah. and that they, or, or it's just the attitude of, um, or, or the, that they'll say things that are just so matter of fact and tr- almost <laughs> trivial knowledge and act like they said something very profound. Right. And like, but it will really just be a platitude while I'm trying to figure out like material, like what to do about problems. They're like, yeah, no, the answer is actually to chill out. And and like think about it right away. <laughs> no, the answer is absolutely um, not. To and so up. and so they are. <laughs> they're quite quite useless in a political context, and so they're they they might as well be foes, uh, because even when they are active and they want to be participate in whatever, they're the ones that will sabotage your meeting. They will their individualism, toxic individualism, will right. ruin the day, um, and be a thorn mm-hmm. in the side. And they, they you know it's a. The, There'll be an opportunist at worst, or just a, a do not like a, a flake. Okay. Um. No, I I can I can definitely understand that. I mean, uh, coming from a skeptical background, I'm incredibly uh, frustrated by just the pseudoscience that they pur- purport, yeah. right? Like, yeah, crystals and healing yeah, our, and this and that and the other thing, and it's all very frustrating. We grew up with Penn and Teller's bullshit and the new atheist stuff, which was <laughs> yeah. very much <laughs> yeah. putting them on the same level as the hyper-religious, you know, in the say, like, between – if you could choose between one and the evangelicals, it's like they're they're both kind of equally insufferable. Um, yeah. And, and, <laughs> but yeah. one will pretend to or, like, act like they are environmentalists or – but they're, they'll be right. just as wasteful as as any bushy person, um, yeah. and it really is a result of bourgeois values, and they don't see it. Um, and then a lot of a lot of self harm in yeah. So it's but but you can't really prove it because it's like there's no evidence to gather because uh, right, they won't right. actually go to a doctor. <laughs> <laughs> right, because that's part of the big yeah. big industry. Right? Yeah, but. So uh, for um, for comrades, I just put generally, um, as I've been mentioning, do paying members of orgs. What we need more of are, and, I, and this is another bit for the Greens, is that I see party building as building a political union. We need unions in our workplaces. We need, you, you know, co-ops. And we need that collective action in, in any aspect of our life at the workplace and also in the ballot box. And for that, we need a political union. And a political union doesn't have to just act electorally. It can act in all sorts of ways, in ways right. as a conduit and facilitator of collective action, in a way that BLM just or any other nonprofit organization, which I'll point you in the direction of any book about the nonprofit industrial complex. Just Google that phrase. Um, that there is an ecosystem of nonprofits because that – because of a skepticism of formal political organizing because or even leadership why well because once upon a time we had leaders and they were all assassinated so yeah. let's not do that again but it was so effective in, in just keeping the left down and and it hurts to, to, to still you know find that there's still this like home there's some people reconsidering it like I have but there's still still like a well let's keep our heads down or let's not Leadership is as toxic and whatever. So we're over an hour. <laughs> yeah. But I just wanted to say we need to have people and, and, and oh yeah, and a, and a skepticism or rather a um, a fear of paid organizers. You know, when when you're on a payroll, you know, we 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 af- we affiliate that with opportunists, people in the Democratic Party, careerists, 
Um, right. And the anarchists have a point about that. But unless it's someone's job or someone can pay materially, have their needs met and organize, it's a real job. There's real work yeah. involved with organizing. Otherwise, you're just left with hobbyism. And that's something that has been part of our like, you know, what's wrong with us? We're all just hobbyists. It's pathetic. Uh, we're doing this like uh, on our free time. It needs to yeah. be our job. Saving the world. Building party. Organizing unions. This and in past revolutions, they did it full time. They had a rich backer, but they also had a lot of people um, paying money in. And it's how any organization, whether it be Planned Parenthood, AARP, they had due paying members. And sometimes it's like your police athletic lead. They just ask for dues once a year. You know, give your hundred dollar donation at the end uh, during Christmas. Right. Time. We can do that, too. And then we have been doing that. So in the past few cycles, the Greens have been. Like the IWW, like pay some dues, even if it's five dollars a month. Um, yeah, whatever. they have sliding scale, like lower tiers. Yeah, yeah. Um, so you don't have to. There's no, we don't. Broke. We're not gatekeeping. We don't want to gatekeep. But when you pay dues, you're a member. You can join a caucus because uh, you don't have to be part of a state party or whatever. Because that can be a bunch of you know white uh, middle class people. But we have caucuses for disability, for trans, for black, for Latin, uh, Latinx. Um, we have a diverse set of caucuses which have the same voting power in our convention as state parties do. Um, and, and they put out their own press releases and so on. Uh, though, um, yeah, so I won't go into that. But, and, uh, and we did kick out the turfs in the Green Party. I want to point that out. Um, in the last two years. Um, and, and it was in 2020, well, 2016 was the shift where we put in the platform that we're a post-capitalist party, right? So, so that really pissed a lot of liberals off, and you know who, are, yeah. who actually identify as capitalists. And um, so, but we're basically saying we're a social, we're going to be a socialist party now. The trots in our party have won, um, <laughs> but uh, we're former trots, so I don't know. But um, and, and and the culmination of that was running a union guy, Howie Hawkins, for for president, uh, which of course made us pariahs. Complete pariahs, even more so because Jill Stein was more of a uniter because she was a type of hippie person. Uh, but then she was vulnerable to being labeled as a reactionary, even though she wasn't. Um, right. Remember when she was called an anti-vaxxer by liberals and this was like uh, <laughs> yeah. the thing that destroyed her or whatever. But she got um, over a million votes, but it wasn't good enough. But. Uh, but yeah, we need full-time organizers and, and I, I pray, I, I hope, and I work for the, to the day that I will be able to actually, when I retire from the state in the next 10 years, cause I'm not going to work a full 30 years, um, to actually do this full time, you know, to do community that's, organizing. Yeah. Um, cause that's what, that's what, that's what succeeded in the past. And, and we've only had part-timers ever since. Yeah, for sure. Well, where can people find you and more of your content? Well, um, the Three Lefts Show has a website, which is threelefts.news, preceded by the www. Um, I'm on Facebook, where I post every episode and some other posts, but very rarely. I'm not a social media file, um, but I do use it as a tool of propagating. I do have the Three Lefts on YouTube where I posted about, you know, a video version of 20 episodes or so. I will be try okay. I'm trying to put more on there over time, but I work full time. And so I'm pretty limited in when I can, how many I'm putting up. Um, For sure. And, and other things in my personal life. Uh, and the radio station, of course, is a big project. So um, there's that. Uh, I am on Macedon. And I think if the whole left went there, then it would be a viable platform for left wing sharing and organizing because Facebook is just and, and Twitter are just not really good for sharing information among ourselves. Um, right. Not anymore. Even though it's where everyone is, what's the point if our posts aren't reaching anybody? Yeah. Um, but so, yeah, otherwise there's I'm on. So my, my show is also just as a normal podcast is with RSS feeds. I'm on any other kind of normal podcast platform, your Google Plus, your Spotify. But um, even though it doesn't have podcasts, I would promote 
a alternative to Spotify for music streaming called Resonate, which is a co-op. Okay. And actually nice. pays the musicians because when you listen to a track, you pay a dime. And But if you listen okay. to it nine times, you own it because you basically paid a dollar. Right. Neat. So other one, awesome. um, otherwise, the station that I help manage is called WCAALP uh, in Albany, New York. And that's basically found at Grand Arts dot org okay that's grand g a g r a n d because it's on awesome grand street very cool well thank you so much for your time i really appreciate it i appreciate you having me on your platform that's all folks thanks for watching or listening remember to share this show with your friends or on the social media site that you use the most Thank you to everyone who supports this show on Patreon. It's really appreciated and it helps me spend more time on this and my other projects. If you want to contribute, you can do that at patreon.com slash skeptical leftist, or you can buy me a coffee at buymeacoffee.com slash skeptical lefty. If you can't contribute financially, then a five-star rating or a re- and a review on the podcast app of your choice or on one of the podcast review sites like Podchaser or ratemypodcast.com would be great. If you want to find more from me, make sure to check out the show notes or check out my link tree. That's linktr.ee slash skeptical Corey. You can find all my social media stuff there, as well as links to my other show, From Many People's Strength, which is a podcast about Saskatchewan politics, and a project I'm involved in with my friend Damien Marie at Hope that's called Atheist, Humanist, Leftist, Revolutionaries. My Twitter is at Skeptical Lefty, and my Facebook page is The Mind of a Skeptical Leftist. You can email me at mindofaskepticalleftist at gmail.com. And if you want to be a guest on the show or know someone I should reach out to, then feel free to let me know. You can book interviews in my available time slots on my Calendly, which is also found in my link tree. Thanks so much for listening, and let's try to make sure we're applying critical thinking and reasoned skepticism when we're attacking the system. If we get caught up in bad thinking, we can derail ourselves. 